Menorah Yisrael, as is our custom, we begin by saying to Tehillim, there's a Tehillim for, tehillah for every possible moment in life, including these very difficult moments. Tehillim Tesvav. Mizmar le David, Adonai mi agur bahonecha, mishkai mahar kachecha. Hoi lechtan im apoyot tzedek, v'doi ver emes bilavavai. Loi ragal al lishoi noi, loi asa l'rei ehu ra'a. V'cherpa loi nasa al kroi vai. Nivza be'enav nimos, v'es yirei adonai chabed. Nishba la hara ve lo yamir. Kaspoi lo nasan ve neshe ve shoychad al lo ki lo lo kach. Oi se ele lo yimoi de li oilam. Tehillim 17, Tessain, 16, Tessain. Mechtam le David, shamreni el ki kasisi va. Amati la doi noi adenoi ato. Toivasi bal alecha la kedoshim asher ba'aretz hema va'adire kochef sivam yirbu atzvoisam acher maharu bal asich niskei midam bal esa eshmoisam al sefasai adinoi men askel ki vechoisi atat hamet varali chavalim nafeli ban imim af nachalos shofra alai. Avarech es adenai asher yatsani afle nois yisroni tel yatsai chivisi adenai le negdi samid kimi mine abal emoi ochein somachli bi vayagel kivodi af pesari yishkoin lavetach kinoisa azayv nashi lishol noisiten chasid cholir ois shachas. Todi eni arach chayim soi vesamachais es panecha neimais bimi nechonetzah. We're gathered here to mourn the loss of a great man, Kisisa Esraish Neiso, and we lift up the heads of the Neiso. There are some people who are head and shoulders elevated above the norm, what's normative. In B'nai Rabbi Yeshua Tzvi, and Rabbi Yosef, and Peril was a great man amongst the wisest of men. Tremendous Talmud Chacham, a Baki in Shas. His entire being was Redifas HaChachma, the thirst for knowledge, chasing after knowledge filled with wisdom, knowledge in areas of medicine, and knowledge in the breadth of scope of every area of Taira. One of his closest, closest friends was also his father-in-law, Rav Hirschung, Zechreina Levracha, Zechreina Tzadik Levracha, was a mentor and a friend, a teacher, and a close role model. His shidduch actually came about through Taira, through a shir that Rav Hirshbrum delivered in Ner Yisrael at the time it was inclement weather. And he was asked to give a shir. And his reply was, if in this weather they want to shir so badly, if people want to learn Taira, how can I not go and teach Taira? And Dr. Judah attended that shir and he was blown away by the breadth and scope of the shear. And after the shear, his very close friend, Jerry Belitsky, commented that he was read a shidduch, the daughter of Rav Hirschsprung, but he wasn't looking into marrying into a rabbinic family with all that it encompasses. And Dr. Judah's comment was, 
I'm all game for it. I would happily marry into the family of such a person. Of course, the rest is history. There was a tremendous mutual understanding between them because of Hirschsprung appreciated his incredible thirst for knowledge. And he attended with him many Gedeiwei, so he has a treasure trove, literally, of videos with Gedeiwei, so that turned to Dr. Judah, not just as a son-in-law of Rav Hirschsprung, not just as a Tratam Chacham with incredible knowledge, but also as a friend, and they would also communicate to him their personal interests and their medical needs and turn to him for advice. <clears throat> when he learned Gemara, it was unlike anything that most of us, our, we are accustomed to in the traditional way of learning a Gemara. When he saw Gemara, he saw the entire picture with his encyclopedic knowledge he would see in front of him many places where the same Tana and Amaira spoke. He would see the time and place that that Tana or Amaira lived and how circumstances of their position affected their thinking and their decisions. The breadth and scope of that was all in front of him when he learned a Gemara always had on his fingertips rare questions from all over Shas. He would challenge people, where can you tell me a story that happened in Are Miklot, in cities of refuge? Things that no one would think about that are bizarre and strange all over Shas and Paiskin and the breadth of Tyra were there at his fingertips. And he always engaged people, young and old, in entire conversation with his insightful questions that would cause a person to probe and think, even if one's initial reaction was that the statement was very strange. It would cause them to think. Sometimes he would ask people, what is Baraivan Hadras Melech? So most people would answer, what does it mean a great crowd, a multitude? Well, you start with a minion and you go from there. And you would point to them the Gemara that says three people is already always challenging people to think. To think about what they're learning, to think about circumstances around them and find a source for it in Torah. Incredible Midas his character traits. I sat next to him in shul for many years, with many discussions. Even as a child, the tremendous respect that he exhibited for children was incredible. It may be something that he inherited from his father-in-law, but if he spoke to somebody and he felt that they were very sensitive, they weren't so learned, or if it was a child, he would be careful to make them feel like they were so knowledgeable. And even if they didn't know what he was talking about, he would make them feel like they're special and knowledgeable. At the same time, when he spoke to someone who was knowledgeable, he would demand of them piercing questions to force them to recognize how much they're lacking and cause them to think about whatever it is that they were discussing. Aside for all the incredible chassadim that he did quietly, the things that he did that I wouldn't be able to talk about until now, he was able to come upon medications that were difficult to, to get in Canada, and he would give them to patients who needed them. He had an ongoing arrangement with one of the local pharmacies where he would supply them with medicine and they would in turn provide the value of those medications for free to people who couldn't afford prescription medication. His silent chesed that he did was incredible. How many people he reached out to and helped medically. 
The morning after 9-11, a younger man was sitting in the waiting room, reading a newspaper, waiting to see Dr. Judah. He came out to him and he said, a yeshiva man, you're sitting and reading a newspaper? You're not learning? So he answered him, I don't have a Gemara. So Dr. Judah was in the middle of treating a patient, a very complicated case. He ran inside, pulled out a bait of Gemara, and he gave it to him. And he saw what he was learning, he went back inside to treat the patient. A minute later, he ran out again and he started telling him there's a me that discusses what you're learning. This is what was on his mind constantly, his unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Saif Avar Hakol Nishma, the end of a person's life, Hakol Nashmi and Masov. We were all affected by him in such a great way. He opened us up to think, imbued us with a desire for Yidiyas Hashem, Chachmas Hashem, knowledge of Torah in every area possible. His friendships, also spoke volumes of who he was as a person, whether it was his close friend, Jerry Belitsky, whether it was Dr. Skarecki, or whether it was Eli Wiesel, or whether it was the Chaim Kanievsky. They all derived, as we did, great pleasure in benefiting from the great wisdom of Rabbi Shuatzvi and Rabbi Yosef. On the behalf of the entire Kehila and the community, I want to ask Mechila from Dr. Judah that we didn't accord him the proper respect according to his wisdom, according to his stature, as such a great Talmud Chacham. May we all merit to learn from his ways, follow in his ways, and witness the idyllic moment of Macha Hashem Bima Me'al Kopanim, when death itself is vanquished, the Neymar Omni. The crowd that is gathered here today with a little impression of the appreciation and recognition of the Nista whom we've come to accompany on his final journey and to take leave of him. Unfortunately, too short notice is given for that purpose. For me personally, it's a great loss. I would... Uh, Say in the words of David Amelach when he spoke after his dear friend Yohannesson had passed away. I'm paid, my brother, that you leave me in such a situation. You were so sweet and so pleasant in the association that we had. These many years that we spent together, especially at the time as my son later referred, when the marriage took place with the daughter of Rav Hirschprung Zatzau. And uh, a new connection was established. We can truly say that Rav Hirschprung was Sarah Teuro. And yet he so much enjoyed the company and the conversation and the together talking in Teuro. In fact, the Posuk says that uh, the, mighty, the mighty have become lost, they have departed. And those who engage in Elchamta Le Torah are no much more with us 
he had something to contribute, contribute even to a giant like Rav Hirschprung, who enjoyed his Torah to that degree. And so, as you heard, was his connection with each and every person. He was fortunate that this last time, through the difficult past years, when his sickness proceeded, that he had such a wonderful partner in life, life companion in Leah. She should be well for the family, for herself, and for all of us. And that he was surrounded by his children, his son-in-law, the doctor, who was always ready at his beck and call whenever it was needed. Though he didn't call it, but he understood himself when he had to come. The children who were constantly with him is an indication what a Torah family is like, sticking together, there for one another. And so it was also for the community at large. He was appreciated and acknowledged and recognized. He was a doctor, but he didn't care for the money. If a person needed help, he was prepared to help gratis. And in fact, mm -hmm. if you look at it, it is all in, contained in his name. The posuk for Yehoshua spells out, Yochus al dal ve'evyoin. And he looks after the avyoinim. He looks after the, the poor and the impoverished. And when he, be, he can do a job gratis as well. And his care and concern was there, as well as his wide medical knowledge. And his second name is Tzvi. The possible for that is Tzal Mozart Metsuuni. Pain and heartache have found me, but your mitzvahs, they are my plaything. They are what gives me inspiration. And so, for example, on uh, Friday night, he would have been late. He was afraid somebody might call that he needs some medical help. He didn't want to be Mechal and Shabbos if it wasn't necessary. Some of you just told me that he, when he came, he was coming to the Shia. He attended my Shia throughout the years. We lived together. I knew I had to prepare very well because I to be on the top of everything when he is going to be there at the Shia. And so he told me that he slept on the floor. He didn't want to miss it. He wants to wake up in time. I didn't know about it at all. So it was at all times and all occasions. And he had always prepared by himself special pills which are needed in an emergency. So if they were needed, so then he would have them ready and could provide them for those who indeed needed them. And so we say, your righteousness goes before you. Kvod Hashem Yosefu, at the time when the glory of God gathers you in, should be bila moves lo netzach mocha Hashem and kim dimo me'al kol ponim ki Hashem dibeya. My father was born in Kosice, Czechoslovakia in 1934. He was still just a young boy when he had to escape with his family. At one point before he was 10, his father was held back, and that was the last time that he saw him. He wasn't even bar mitzvah when he decided on his own that he wanted to go to Israel and joined Aliyat Noar. As part of that program, he was in Belgium for a few years. Even before he was bar mitzvah, he was the only one of two people in that community who could lane mafter. And after he was bar mitzvah, he was the Balkora. He had an excellent knowledge of Tanakh and used to attribute part of that to the time he was there. Rather than just memorizing the Sedra, he would learn it. He came to Israel with Aliyat Noor and worked on a kibbutz in Anitzid for a few months when he told the heads that he wanted to go to yeshiva. They dissuaded him and told him that if he worked there for a few years, they would pay for it. He decided he didn't want to wait, left on his own without any money, and interviewed and was accepted at Yeshiva Skfaroah, where he learned for a few years. And there he developed a relationship with Rav Nerya. He then went to Merkaz Arab, where he was very close with Rav Tzuyuda Cook. 
My father decided that he wanted to become a doctor. And as there was no real medical program back in Eritrea at that time, he moved back to Toronto to join his mother, sister, and brother. He taught himself English from a dictionary and came to Toronto. Throughout his time in Toronto, my father had a very close relationship with his Rebbe, Rabbi Price, and he was one of Rabbi Price's close, closest Talmudim. My father didn't spend years in yeshiva, but he made up for lost time by spending most of his free time learning. He would go to sleep late and he was up early. Whenever he had a few free minutes, we would find him with a safer. When he would ask, he would always just say, oh, I'm, I'm just looking something up. He had a remarkable knowledge and an excellent bakiyas. He would always repeat what my grandfather would say. If you don't chazer, you won't know. I'm a chazer nish kem nish, I'm a chazer nish bidik nish. He had a beautiful relationship with my grandfather who he viewed as more, than a, as more father than father-in-law, and who my grandfather in turn viewed more as a son than son-in-law. If you looked at the notes in his shas, you would think that he spent years of learning full-time given the breadth and depth of his knowledge, but he showed us that if you make time for what's important, you can, you can accomplish a tremendous amount. Many patients from Rabbanim to regular Balabatim would always express how impressive it was that in his doctor's office, he had his shas right behind him, and it wasn't for show. He would learn whenever he could. When he had to be home late from work, he would call from the office and we would learn over the phone. Sometimes he was delayed and he did his yat dafiomi from there. He was never boastful in what he knew. He always downplayed it. If he knew a Gemara that someone asked him, he would say, it's just bluffing. Rav Chaim Zimmerman once called him Rav and my father told him that he didn't have smicha. Rav Chaim Zimmerman said to him, you know more than, more than, the, more than most of the musmachim I have, I'm giving you smicha right here. Despite that, he refused to let anyone call him anything other than doctor, which he felt was his true calling. And he made sure to spend all his energy helping people. If someone needed medical attention and called the house and asked to speak my to my father, it didn't matter what he was doing. He would stop and talk to that person on the other line and try to help in any way he could. People would come over at all hours to talk to him for medical attention. I remember many times that people would, would be over. It didn't matter if it was someone that he knew well or just the person from the community. He would give them his full attention and effort to help. Many times at night, he would come home from work after seven, eat supper, and get a call that someone needed help, and he would drive out to help them. It didn't matter if they were a block away or all the way up north. I remember one time there was an elderly Yid who lived up near Neri Strom. I was having issues constantly, and my father drove up numerous times to help him, no matter. And he would say, he's an, he's an elderly man. Why would I make him schlep to me? My father wasn't young at that time. But if he could help, he would be. He refused to take money when he helped. If it was something he could charge for, he would tell the person to make the check payable to various yeshivas and sadakas. I once helped him when I was younger, when someone was over for medical help. The person came over after Shabbos and left him an amount. I don't remember now, I was quite young, but I believe it was a few hundred dollars as a thank you. My father called me up then and told me, as I helped, I could choose which pushka to put the money in. Keeping it wasn't even a thought. He considered his ability to help people, his purpose in the world, and never viewed it as a chore. He was an incredible son. My grandmother lived with us even after, and even after she fell and forgot how to speak English or even how to eat, he did everything in his power to make sure she could stay at home. Together with his sister, they paid for around-the-clock care, but when things became too difficult for the help, my father would take over. He helped feed her, and whenever her caregivers needed help, he would help with any task, always in the most serious way so that his mother wouldn't feel embarrassed even when she no longer knew who he was. My father had a serious medical issue after a medical major medical procedure wasn't successful many years ago. It affected him in many ways, specifically his eating and sleeping, and yet he made the most of it and didn't let him stop it in any way, maintaining a busy schedule with long hours and never complaining about it. He couldn't sleep for more than a few hours at a time without getting up, so many times when he would get up, he would just go downstairs and learn for a bit and then go back to sleep. My father never held grudges. If someone said something rude to him, he never talked, he didn't let it bother him, he just moved on. He always taught us that if you're wrong, admit it and apologize. He was sensitive to others and how they felt, but if that wasn't returned to him, he didn't make an issue of it. He always focused on what was important to him, helping others, his family, and learning. Right until he, came, he became ill, when he was over 80, he would wake up early, go to Dafyomi, go to work, come home for a bit, and then went, went to another Dafyomi share. I want to specifically thank my brother-in-law, Jeffrey, with his help for everything. We would, have been, we would have been lost without him. My uncle, Mark, for always helping and being there for my father and our family. His relationship with my father was more like a brother than a brother-in-law. To label Gerstner, who learned with my father almost every night after he was unable to go to Shul anymore and to do the Dafyomi Shir. 
Up until he was too weak to look through his Gemara, they continued their regular share for many years. I want to thank his closest friend, Jerry Belitsky, and his wife, Tammy, who always called daily to check in on him and how his feeling taught for their help. To my uncle, Tavo, when my father was not well a few months ago, came and spent quite a few weeks with us and made the time more enjoyable for my father. And thank you to his caregiver, Maylene, who these last few months tried to make him as comfortable as possible with the utmost compassion and care. From my father's entire cheder class, he was the only one who survived between 80 to 100 boys. Every Yisker, he would try and remember his classmates, say their names so that they wouldn't be forgotten. He would mention them at every simcha. He knew he was given an opportunity that his cheder classmates weren't. He tried to make the most of his time here and do the most good that he could in that time. He was an incredible Lamdan teacher, doctor, father, grandfather, and friend. And we all try our hardest to emulate him and to continue his legacy. It's hard to know what words I can say about our father, our guide deeply touched the lives of us and so many. My father got married, started his family later in life, and I'm the youngest child, so I had a privilege that none of my classmates had, not just a father, but a link to a previous generation. When we're Torah and Chesed, they weren't just central to what you did, but they were organically imbued and imprinted in who you were. My father lived a way that every part of his life was Torah-based. When me and my brother mentioned that he was the oldest father in the class, and the most in shape too. His response was that he smiled and said, well, Yosef is called the Ben Sekunim of the Torah, but that would be my older brother, Yassi. So what would they call me? What would they call the son that comes after the Ben Sekunim? And he would show us in Zalchamesh. We have a beautiful, large painting in our dining room. And my father loved uh, his one comment on it. Whenever anyone visited, was there's a little river on it. And he would say, where's that seed in the Chamesh? And for him, the Torah was so democratic. He loved that. No one really knew the answer except one unassuming Talmud Chacham from our show, Mr. Kipper, who knew the answer. And he loved to point out he was the greatest Rosh Hashivas, you know, who knew it because no one else did. Everyone who came across him recognized and would point out how unique of a person he was. He had his own story growing up. He grew up in a Hasidish family in Europe. And my brother alluded to his miraculous survival during the Holocaust, eventually ending up through Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael before coming back to Toronto where he didn't speak a word of English. Um, but managed to get to where he was in life. And he used to tell me that when he was in uh, yeshiva, that other boys were silly, he would say, that they had a guttle as Rosh Hashiva for Tzuyuda cook, and they didn't fully capitalize on the opportunity. He would walk Rosh Tzuyuda home every single day, build a kesher with him, and that was a theme through his life, including becoming a Talmud of the owner of Price, son-in-law of Maizeda, or Pinchas Hirschbrun. He'd go out of his way to be able to meet with Gedolim, to talk to Torah and them, and his famous Gedolim wall on his, in his library showed the pictures of him and, his, and the Gedolim and the time he appreciated with them. He would love asking them his Gemara questions with his answers from obscure places and discussing that with them. Daddy was the rock that kept me grounded and on the proper path by modeling that no matter what Derek you choose in life, Torah and Chesed need to be central. I'd hear him passing by my bedroom in the morning at 5.30 to get ready and learn before he would go to work see him learning late at night after his long days in his library, surrounded by his farm, like a king in his palace with his beautiful surroundings, yet always having time for us, no matter what we needed. He remembered how busy medical school was when he went through it, and he would call me sometimes when I was studying in the evening. He was never a big schmoozer on the phone. He would ask how my day was. I would say, good, Baruch Hashem, and he'd say, good. I know you're busy. And open up above Metziah to Daflam and Gimel, I had a thought. And usually by the time we were done, I'd have a few Gemaras open, a novel fetish or two, and he'd say, thank you. I know you're busy. I'll let you go back to your studying. Sitting in shawl as a kid on Shabbos can be difficult, but sitting next to daddy during leaning, or we used to sit right back over there, the old setup of the shawl, and I'd try to peek at all his arrows on the side of his chumash that he had. Um, our walks home from the shawl, we just lived down the block. For the last ones to leave show, we'd be speaking to Ox and learning and we'd have a slow walk home discussing excitedly, you know, the terror that he was discussing with Ox and some Parsha. And every extra moment of his was learning. He was hospitalized once, maybe about 10 years ago for some monitoring and he brought his Gemaros with him. 
he didn't let it disturb his whole time. And the doctor even pointed out he was just sitting in his in his bed there, just learning the whole time until he was discharged. And all the years he was healthy, I never saw him unoccupied. He was always amazed as kids when we would say that we're bored. As between his work, his Torah and Chesed, he didn't understand how, how you could possibly be bored. He used to say he barely had time to use the bathroom, like how busy he was. And to this day, it really makes me question any time I have that I'm spending I you know how I could be using it better. I'm speaking a lot about his Torah, but his chesed was paramount too. Caring for his mother, our Bobianyu, like my brother spoke about, so she could stay living in her own apartment, right connected to our house, even towards the end of her life. And despite all those hours he spent learning, he would spend hours on the weekends, late at weeknight, helping people get to in the community with their medical issues, not having to go to the emergency department. And even if it was just to speak with them, even if they didn't need medical treatment per se, but just to help alleviate their anxiety. And just in the last few days, I was, I was looking for an obscure safer, which I found, of course, in my father's library. And a thank you card fell out from it, uh, from one of uh, someone in the community, a patient who mentioned just the ease that he put them through at the difficult time they were going through. This was his everyday routine. His generosity and chesed as well. He would give large sums of money to struggling family and friends without any expectations, you know, really or, uh, any expectations of thank you. It was just for them, no strings attached. Someone once referred to my father as a renaissance man with a deep knowledge in so many areas, Torah, medicine, history. And there's a term that they often use nowadays, a disruptor, right? Which is someone who can come up with a way or a technology that changes the way people think. And he was the disruptor before that term was used. The way he would learn Hamish or Gemara, that like Ramos was alluding to, or approach Ashkaka in a way that wasn't taught in Yishinaz, and with the help of this tremendous Nikias. And as I get older and I'm learning more, I realize that his way was a unique blend, but I haven't seen that found or replicated in another Svarim. As I said, Daddy was connected to Torah with everything, and fitting for Purim, my older brother Yassi was his big son, so he used to call him his, his Seresh. And in, in reality, though, he was so about to have another big son, and not just one daughter, but three daughters in total. His two incredible daughters in law, who, despite the young families, always come and make Jeffrey, there's no way of saying a son in law who's like a son. You're more than a son. And the kavod, the care, that, the time you made for daddy made such a huge difference. And her son in prison, and how to be there for others. The importance of family was so important to my father. All his siblings bought properties on the same block so they could live near each other and close. And he made him so proud in, in this way. My father didn't grow up with a father of his own. His father was killed in the Holocaust when he was quite young. Yet he was such an incredible father to us all. He loved his children, his grandchildren. He had so much nachas from seeing them, from spending time with them, hearing their accomplishments and just hearing what they had to say. He was really a link to the past. And as my brother alluded to, every symbol he would mention, his eight or so classmates, his different chadaram, his rebellion, he was the only one that survived. And he would give us a car to thank you, Hashem, for saving him. On Kiddush and Friday night, he would have his eyes closed and he would tell me he would go through in his mind those children and by Yisker as well, because no one else remembered them. Daddy, I was blessed to have the time I did with you. Daddy was always looking for us in everything in life. And I am joining the rest of your siblings and your parents, your classmates, Bobby and Zeta, and Lola Mavis. Daddy will miss you all dearly. We'll remember you close in our hearts and do everything to live up to the high standard you set and continue to make you proud and be a for your vision. This past Friday night, a few hours before my father-in-law passed away, we were all together. We were all around him singing Shalom Aleichem and he was sitting there at peace. And during one of the time that we were singing, he opened his eyes and tried to sing with us. And that was the last time. Those were the last words that he said. Later on in the evening, we were singing with him. 
We know that he heard us. And the words of David Amalek really struck me. And he said, The past few years, the past few years, there was a lot of Lila. It was not easy this past few years. He had a lot of Eastern. Unlike the Rav and the Mayadasha and Yassi and Ari, um, there was a lot of biker before. And during the dark times, we had to stick with our Amuna. We don't know why things happened. But during the good years, we, we thank Hashem for the amazing time that Daddy had and the, time, and the time that we could learn from him. He always used to quote his father-in-law, Rav Hirschbrunk, when he started his speeches. And he would say, Paisam the Chvayda Sanya. He brought it from the Gemara and Brachas and Afsan Gimel. And really, the Asanya that's here, all of you who are here to bring honor to him, thank you for coming to, to bring honor to him. And of course, the Asanya, the Shul, his beloved Shul, Teres Amos of you, Mount, you know, as, as the boy said, you know, sitting in the back corner there, this, this was his life. And how many Shabbosim went by where people would come over and ask questions? And how many times were there? Me a Bavakama. By the way, when you get the Bavakama, get me a site to also. Give me a shulchan from the library. And this is Kaseder every single Shabbos. The learning was here with Rebox every single week. You know, people sometimes think that these stories are exaggerations or, or, or kind of one time that this happened. All of the time, my father in law, he didn't want to sleep through this year, slept on the floor. That way he'd always have the kayak to wake up and come to this year. I feel that speaking here is, is almost an impossible task and, and almost needs to ask Mechila to my father-in-law. Because first of all, there's no way that my father-in-law, anybody who knew him, there's no way that he would want us being up here and saying all of these nice things about him. And there's really no way to do him justice. He always used to make jokes about uh, about Leviathan. He would say that you know the the Tyra has a sense of humor. When we have the Seder of Parshas, it says Afre Mois and then Kedushim and then Emor. So after people pass away, they talk about all the Kedusha that they had. In his case, though, it's very real. And we're only going to scratch the surface. But I think that you'll hear the themes that are developing between what Ari said and what Yossi said and what I'll add to. This is really the end of an era. My father-in-law was a child of the Holocaust, and this was a lasting theme on many things that he did in his life. The story about how he was a continuation of his, his classmates, I'm actually gonna read you verbatim what he wrote in, in the speeches that he used to say at the wedding, because I think it's very poignant and really drives home a point of what he was living with and what he was living for. As a young boy in Hungary, my father placed me in the Talmud Torah of our city in a class of more than 30 boys. Two years later, he transferred me to a private theater in the house of the Malamed, where we had a class, again, of more than 30 boys of all ages. Mornings, we attended for general studies at a public school. The government took all the Jewish children from the various public schools and segregated them in one school. All together in the different classes, I had approximately 100 classmates. None of our rabbeim survived. Of the approximately 100 children, the only survivor, and this was him sa saying this standing at the chasnas, the only survivor stands before you. I feel, and this is again his words, I represent my classmates and friends who did not have the schus to have children and marry them off. As I was standing under the chuppah, I was thinking about them. I could see the faces of some of them, young faces, faces that did not age in over 65 years. And on the paper that, that he gave this speech from, you could see there were the names of some of the classmates and the names of some of his rabbeim that were written in the margin down below. And he, and he, continue, and he continued in a tiny measure as long as even one person remembers them, they are still somewhere here and their memories are not completely forgotten. As his neshama goes up to Ganeid and Shalmaila, 
he'll be greeted by so many people. His father, who he hasn't seen in so many years, his father-in-law, Rav Hirschbrun, Zechot Tzadik Levrocha, his Rebbe Muvak of Price, Zechot Tzadik Levrocha, and his hundred classmates who are living on all of these years through him. We often say a picture is worth a thousand words. And one of my most favorite pictures that, that are in the house is a picture of my father-in-law that really captures his true essence. It was taken probably about 20 years ago after Pinchas' first grandchild was born. And there's a picture of him sitting in his study. And that was the place that we all came to know if he wanted to find daddy, that's where he's gonna be. He's gonna be in his study. There's gonna be a lamp on on his table. He's gonna be hunched over a Gemara. And you would like come in and you'd kind of have to rustle some papers and make some noises because otherwise like there's no way that he would see you. But he had his one-year-old grandson on his lap, sitting there focused intensely on the Gemara and he was wearing his scrubs. And we snapped this picture it was before cell phones. It was with somebody had to run and grab a, one of the film cameras. And we snapped this picture. And when we see it now, it encompasses the, the three main areas of his life. He was wearing his scrubs, that was his medicine. He was sitting and learning. That was what was his main drive in life. He had a grandchild on his lap, that was his family. When it came to learning, and we've heard already, he would go with, to Gedalim with Rav Hirschsprung over the years. There's a story that we love to repeat. One year he went to, uh, with Rav Hirschsprung to visit the Gara Rebbe. And the next year when he wasn't there, the Gara Rebbe asked him, he says, where's your son-in-law, the Talmud Chacham? And Rav Hirschsprung answered with a smile and he said, Talmud Chacham, but from a doctor. There are many pictures and videos of him talking and learning with Gedalim, and it's amazing. Occasionally, there might have been some people that saw this, this clean-shaven guy with a kipasuga, and they'd make the mistake of judging a book by its cover. Let me tell you, they would never make that mistake again after he was finished cleaning the floor with them and learning. He came to Canada looking to, to go to medical school. And one of, the, one of the sayings that he always imparted us is Ezu Chacham Arayas Anayled. Always trying to look ahead, always planning ahead. And it was at a time where they thought that there would be a medical school in Israel, but it wasn't there yet. And he says, listen, I have to go to Chutzlaris for this. But before he settled and went to medical school in, in Canada, he actually took a farher at uh, Yeshiva University because he knew that there might be an opportunity to, uh, to go to medical school there. And again, another story that just illustrates the, the, the character and the godless of what we saw him in him all the time. So he somehow on his own navigates and gets a farher, he goes to, goes to YU. And he was sitting there with Remendel Zax, the, the son-in-law of the Chavetz Chaim. And he sits down, he opens the Gemara, and, and he said, Zach says to him, Zog. So he opens the Gemara, he reads the Gemara, translates the Gemara. Like he's sitting there, he's not very impressed. And he looks at him again, he says, Zog. So my father-in-law is like, I don't know what, I, what he wants from me, I'm going to keep going. So he just keeps going in the Gemara and translating the Gemara. So Zach says to him, he says, on this Gemara, there have been there have been bottles of ink that have been spilled on this Gemara, countless svarim that have been written on this. It's like, there's nothing else you can say. And my father-in-law had been busy in, in school and imagine like he, he's like learning English and preparing and trying to pass high school. So he's like sitting there and, and Rav Zach says, says to him, um, do you know what the, what the Rambam says on this? So my father-in-law says, I have no idea what, 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 what he's talking about. So, so he asks, he says, okay, it's okay. You don't know the Ramam, that's okay. He says, what would you on your own say about this Gemara? So my father-in-law thinks for a minute, looks at him, and he tells him what he would think about this Gemara. So Zach looks at him, he says, they are good, they are good. My father-in-law is like getting all excited. It's like, finally, we're like, we're, we're getting somewhere on this far. Harry says, 
Aber der Rambam sagt, Pumpfackert. So my father-in-law sat and he thought for a second. He says, if that's what the Rambam says, there's actually a Tysus a few dafen later that would be very problematic. If Zach's like, listen to this, like, ooh. So as a side point, I asked him, how did you know this Tysus? How did you remember this Tysus? He's like, don't ask me. You know, I just, I just happened to remember it. And this was Kaseder all the time. Whenever he'd pull out some obscure maramakam or a dapper, are you show me this or that? And you say, Daddy, how did you know that? You're like, I don't know. I just came across it. It was like safer. I was learning it yesterday. So my father in law said, you know, Zach's looked at him and he says, I have no idea what he saw in me because I had no idea what I was talking about. Picks up the phone. He says, Dame Bucher, give him Alice. And he's like, accept it on the spot. It's just an illustration, but I think it, it highlights this was not one mice. This was all the time that he was pulling out these, the, his breadth of what he knew. He was able to do this all the time. A few other things that I just wanted to point out. And again, I know that I'm just scratching the surface on this. When we come into the house and we see his Gemaras, his Gemaras are like no other Gemara that you've ever seen. His Gemaras have been learned through, they're old, they're yellowed, they've been bound, they've been rebound. And if you look in, in, the, in the pages of the Gemara, the underlines, he has in his, in his own very specific, he always uses a very specific pen, his very specific way of writing notes, he kind of write in the, in the margins of the Gemara, all of these chadushim, and you see like the, the whole shas, literally underline after underline, chiddush after chiddush in the margins, and and where he had the time, and, 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 and even if one does have the time, the ability to, to go through shots like that, it's, it's, it's astounding. But I, I've never seen a Gemara like that. It literally is a Gemara that's alive. And when he lived with the Gemara, the Gemara was alive also. To him, it wasn't just, you know, we read, we read the, the Amarayim, this person said this, this person said that. For him, it was a living organism. The Gemara was alive in front of him. We, we kind of learn a Gemara and he, and, 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 you know, without even looking at the Bach or at, without looking at another Sefer, you know, you read, you know, it says Amarava here. He's like, nah, this can't, this can't be. It can't be that it's Rava. He's like, daddy, how do you know that? He's like, what do you mean? Doesn't everybody know that Rava wasn't around in the Gemara at this time in this place? He took that as a Dover Kasha, but that, the Gemara went behind him and he saw that in front of him. And one of the things that was also amazing, because I think when somebody gets sick, you start to see their, their true essence. Even as things were difficult, the thing that he consistently did, and we have a huge Akarsa type to Reb Label for this, the, the, the learning of the Reb Label, the Daf, and then learning the Masechta that they were learning together, that was always the thing. There was one time of the day, it was always the same day. It didn't matter what the day brought and how difficult the day was, there was that learning. And even as recently as a week ago, and this was amazing, we were sitting, we were talking, and we were talking to the boys about Purim and whether they should drink or they shouldn't drink. And just out of the blue, and it, was, it was beautiful, just out of the blue, we started talking about the Gemara Megillah Bapha. He started talking about Kam Rabba, Shafte Lerib Zera, and he said the whole Gemara Bapha. My uncle Chippy told me the Pasuk, it says, and this is apropos for this time of year, Vatihi Esther Noises Chain Be'inik Korea. Esther found favor in everybody's eyes. What, what in the Gemara says, Malamit Shikol Echad, that everybody felt Esther was part of the When it came to learning, the father of universal language. He could talk to Rebbes, he could talk to Rashi Yeshiva, he could talk to Gedai Le'adar. He had a Kesha with Eli Wiesel. He used to read his books and he used to send it back directions. He said, you missed this, so you might want to fix this. And everybody who spoke to him, left him with a chiddin. Everybody left him with something new. Everybody who, who he was involved in their life, they felt that their life was enriched as a result. And the amazing thing is, as Yassi and Ari said about my father-in-law's life, this was all self-taught. This was all his own. He had every excuse to not succeed, to not push, to not be driven. 
This was all his drive, going to Eretz Yisrael, going to Yeshiva, seeking out a Kesher with Yeshiva, Kaseder, Kaseder his entire life. Another Pasuk, the man could be told me, the more that we speak about this, the more we remember. The stories are endless. And I know that the, the time is getting late and I don't want to keep everybody. But just one or two more things that I wanted to talk about. When we talk about that picture, my father-in-law sitting at the desk wearing his scrubs. You know, some, some heroes, they wear capes. And my father-in-law had two uniforms. There was his scrub suits, often with a scrub cap. And then there was his somewhat oversized trench coats and gray hats and medical bag. And the scrub suits was for the day. And when he was with his patients, his kindness, his compassion, of course, the medical expertise goes without saying, but he could always relate to people. And the amazing thing was, you know, sometimes he'd say something to us, you'd hear him talking on the phone and say like, daddy, I didn't know you knew Portuguese. And it's like, well, you know, I have a lot of patience and I kind of learned the important words and kind of sayings and I can say some jokes, not all of them, you know, sometimes a little off color, but he, he learned that so that he could relate to his patients and speak to his patients. And the same was true for Rabbanim and Rashi Yeshiva you know, they thought that they were coming in. They thought the hardest part of coming might be a, a physical examination. Little I know that it would turn into quite a, quite a complex schmooze back and forth and learning. And what was supposed to be a five-minute appointment would end up going for an hour with all of the learning afterwards. Now, the trench coats, well, actually, one more thing. You know, when he was in his scrub suits uh, in the hospital, um, he always had this thing that he used to tell me, and it was amazing. If he knew that there was somebody that he knew in the community who was going for surgery, he worked at Toronto, Toronto Western, Toronto General, which is where a lot of surgeries in the city happen. For sure, if it was his patients, he would make sure to be there the day of the surgery. He said that, I know that if I'm there, they're going to make sure that they're going to take better care. They're going to take more time. They're going to make sure that this gets done properly. It's not going to be the resident doing the surgery. I'm going to be there and I'm going to make them a choy to do it so that it's the best possible outcome. And even in situations where he wasn't involved in the case, um, where he maybe didn't know the people so well, if he knew, he would go over to the surgeon. They all had the change room and he would go over and he'd strike up a conversation and he would talk to them about the person. And again, so that the people would know that there's somebody here who cares about another yid and wanted to make sure that they got the best care and the best outcome possible. His after hours costume was his trench coat and his gray hat, which I think might have been black at one time. He would always go out, as you heard, he'd go out to visit people, didn't matter where they were. He didn't want people to travel to him or to be Matria. He'd sit, he'd stay there much longer than he needed to. Kind word, Advar Tara. And people saw that, you know, people, there was once a comment, somebody said, one of the, I think it was one of the Rebbe's that said to him, says, I wish you would live in New York. We need somebody like you in New York here. One of the things that he didn't like to talk about, because um, again, he was very modest this way, but he was a urologist. He was a male. And he was involved. And I asked him, I said, Daddy, how many bris milas do you think you did in your life? said, I lost track. I said, was it hundreds? He's like, no. Thousands? He's like, yes. How many thousand? He couldn't remember. There was times that he used to, he used to take the day off work. He'd go to Buffalo. He would do Mila after Mila after Mila. And this was a routine for him for, for, for years that he did this and he was involved in this. My mother-in-law told me this story about how he was once walking on the streets and somebody saw him and said, hey, there's Dr. Judah. He's like, he made me Jewish. It's hard to imagine the, this chus, you know, of a, of a male who does tens of milas, hundreds of milas. Somebody who's involved in this does thousands of milas. And again, this was, this was all on his own personal time, he was taking off work. He didn't care that he wasn't earning from it, but this was his priority. This is what was important to him. 
The last thing in that picture that we saw was his, his love and his dedication to family. And as Khan always says, there's nothing that he wouldn't do for his family. We heard about his kibbutz aim, his respect for Bobby on you, how he cared for her. You always saw his dedication to his kids, so Yossi, Ari, and Hana, and then of course to, you know, as, as, the, as the family grew to Tamar and Molly and the grandchildren, he was always there to solve any problem. And when there was a problem that he couldn't solve easily, I'll never forget this, when there was a, a, a serious issue that came up from a health perspective, he looked at me, he's like, how much is this gonna cost me? I think there's going to be a lot of money for Tzedaka. He loved his grandchildren. And the beautiful thing was, and you hear this, this theme, he could speak in one minute to a Shiva, and the next minute he could be playing with one of the grandchildren. And from the oldest to the youngest, you know, from the, the oldest, it was a Kesher in learning. And the amazing thing is that we go through the Parshas and we have Parshas now. I was like, okay, you remember what Zeta said? This Pasuk? Like, yeah, of course. We know, we know this Pasuk. This? Yeah, yeah, this was Zeta's Chiddush. Do you know how to read this Pasuk? Like, yes. And that, that came from years and years of, of hearing him, hearing his Tyra, and being able to be passed down to the, to the next generations. One of the things that gave him the most joy over the past few months was seeing the, the littlest grandchildren, seeing the little Babelach, you know, seeing seeing the little girls, seeing Tamima and seeing Chaya, and it brought him huge joy, even when he was so sick. There's a story that Pinchas told me, which again, I think speaks to, speaks to his essence. So once Pinchas used to go over to the house, it's a little secret, we don't have a TV at our house, but they did. So he'd go over to watch, uh, to watch sports, and I think that his team lost, and he was up upset. My father-in-law was, of course, learning in his study right nearby, I guess he came and he came out to see what was happening. And he sees Pinchas upset. He comes up and he's like, who cares? Like, there's just, there's just a bunch of guys playing sports. Like, what do you care about them so much? And that was his essence because, you know, it was, it was a waste of time. It was idle. But in the same breath, and this beauty of it, he looked at Pinchas like, Pinchas, of course I know what this is like. It's like, I followed soccer. I, in Kashitsa, they had a soccer team. I knew all of the players on the soccer team, and he listed all of the players on the soccer team that many years later. When we speak about family, family, we, um, we don't always choose our families, but Baruch Hashem, he, he was in a family that was filled with exceptional people and family and friends around him. And what was already said, but I think bears repeating, we owe a special Akarsa type to people who are friends and like family. Um, we talk about Reb Label Gerstner for his diligence and learning with him, to his best friend, Jerry Belitsky and his Asia Kyle Tammy. Many aunts and uncles on the Hirschsprung side whose to heal him and support is always there. Uncle Table for coming in and being a savior when we, when we were in crisis and we needed help. And Uncle Mark, who brother is, is almost too far a word to use. I don't know what we do without you, Uncle Mark. And finally to Maylene, who was my father-in-law's caregiver at the end of his life, who literally, the, the word is overused, but she literally is an angel. To Yassi and Molly, Ari, Tamar, and Hana, daddy raised such beautiful and wonderful people. You all Makai in the mitzvah of Kibarava and Dura. Daddy was so proud of you, so proud of his grandchildren, and Bezu Hashem will continue to make him proud. There's nothing that gave him more nachas than seeing you guys and being together with you. And to mommy, what can I say than to quote from daddy's speech? 
This is what daddy said at the wedding. Leah, I want to thank you, my life partner, for the mother you are, for your loyalty, and for giving my life an extra meaning. These past months have not been easy, and you are so dedicated to daddy. Shem should give you the strength and the gizun to carry on. Should always be surrounded by love and nachas. And may have some shana. As a Hashem, Daddy should be a melitzer for you, for Hannah, for Yasi and Ari, and for the entire family. Bila Amavas and Netza, Moch Hashem, Dima Al Kalpana. I ask everyone to please rise as they will move into the site of Kelmavet. Before, before that came by, I would like to share with you a fatore that was said to me when we were learning the Sekhti Sukhe years ago, and I didn't quite remember it. But uh, Friday morning when I was admitted into the house and to see again the Shotzvi, Zechana Levrocho, the idea occurred to me, do you have the Gemara Sukha with you? It's a very difficult Akashi. And you gave me once a very good explanation. I don't remember exactly what it was. So they brought up the Gemara. They took it out. I opened the Rashi. The Rashi says a very strange remark, unusual for Rashi. He said that the question there is, Truma Tahoiro. Truma, which is, of course, given to the coin, if it's clean, if it's pure, not Tome, then you can make an Eruv with Neir Tashim. So um, Rashi says, there is a possibility that the Gemara discusses in Soito Chobes, which says you can, uh, Trumas Koyen is Nesrefes. If there is a Truma of a Koyen and it can't be eaten, it is burned. So he said, and that you could make Mati and Neder, that the Truma loses its Kedusha, and Yisrael could eat it. So Rashi says, if he has a grandchild, a koyen, and the koyen will eat it, you can do that. The eating is also a mitzvah. Otherwise, if he wants to take away the kedusha and he should eat it, the oise do roshehu. person does it is a rosheh. So why is he a rosheh? It's unusual for Rashi to describe if you violate this law, then you're a rosheh. So he said, because the mitzvah is that Thomas Koyen, if it can't be eaten, this reference, it has to be burnt. And if you are so careful about a piece of dough that you want to take away the Kedusha, to strike this, this is a Roshi. So this was the explanation that I found written in his Gemara at the side and brought back the toilet to me. So it's a lot to learn. Mole Rahamim, Shekhem Bamiroyamim, Hamid Say, Menukhanakara Kafesh, Yama Alois, Kidashim, Tarim Kizarak Yamas, Yerim, Esnishmas, Rabbi Shuts, Vivel Rabbi Ayase, Shahalach, Lailamoy. Ba'avur shebli neder niten tzedaka, ba'ad haskaras nishma sa'i. Begam ne'yedem te'hem enuka sa'i. Rachim ba'la rachim yesterday and sister k'nafav la'ilamim. V'yitzwar b'sra chayim es nishma sa'i. Adai no'i hu nachala sa'i v'enuach b'shamayim. Al mishkavai v'enoi ma'ar. Amen. Shiva will be at his home before he grew out of you.
times of that link will be announced. The Kura will be in the third center section of Bathurst Lawn Cemetery. Please allow for the available to leave first when we follow the order. Dr. Judah, though we won't be to change your name in the chat function uh, to something that the family can identify, you can also use the chat function to send to the family. Yes. 
Oh, with Jerry. Once again, to all those who joined us on Zoom, thank you for giving a befitting covet offering to Dr. Tibor Judah, all of us. Shalom. As you can see, the shul is full. 
and there was a nice representation on Zoom as well. Please use the chat function to send any messages you'd like to do so now. It does not preclude you from, of course, being the Nachmovel in the right time to the family. We should again meet of Simchis. And finally, if your name is not identifiable on Zoom, please take a moment to rename yourself to your actual name. We will be closing to the moment.